Titus 2, if you would. Titus 2, 1st, 2nd, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus. A short letter, just in case you haven't turned to it already, a bit of context, just so you know to whom this is being written, by whom, and why. Uh, Titus is part of ministry team Paul. Uh, this is very close to the end of Paul's life. That's why we have 2nd Timothy being one of the last things he wrote in life and then Titus immediately after. Paul is at the end of not only his life, but his ministry, and he is passing the torch to the next generation of preachers, evangelists, church planters, uh, and in Titus's case, his church, uh, let's call them solidifiers. Titus has been sent to the island of Crete. There has been a spat of church planting, but if you take a look uh, right at the very beginning, at 1.5, Paul writes to him, this is why I left you in Crete. So they went together, Paul moved on, but he left Titus there, and here's Titus's mission. So that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. We have very, very nascent little baby churches, and they need, they need strengthening and structure and building up, and that's what Titus's job is going to be. He's going to go around the island, meet each of these uh, congregations, Strengthen them, build them up, give them structure so that they can eventually learn to uh, walk or fly, think baby bird, on their own. Part of that is finding leaders in the church. You, it's very tough to have uh, church leadership if you haven't got people who know how to lead or maybe they're gifted but aren't confident in their gifting. So it is Titus's job to go around, find them, Strengthen them, train them, establish them so that he can confidently move on to the next one. Uh, during one of our, we recently had those seven members, and during one of our membership interviews, someone asked me about the structure of Ajax Baptist here, about a plurality of elders, and I said, I absolutely agree, it's very biblical. However, practically, you can only have a plurality of elders if you have a plurality of elders. And so... If you have that in goal, you have to start training men to act in an elder capacity. It's the same thing Titus is doing here, same thing we've had across church history, building up structure. It takes investiture, which is really what we're looking at. So that takes us to the start of chapter 2. You should, you should long since be there by now. <laughs> but as for you, Paul writes to Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Now, here's what accords to sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Lord, add his blessing to that reading as we now come to the charge to senior saints. In the book of Proverbs, you may think, oh, what does the Bible have to say about old age? Uh, it would, might surprise you quite a lot. Um, sometimes um, in a callous and slightly derogatory way, we talk about people, say, over the age of 60 or 65 as the gray hairs or the silver hairs, I've heard that. Gentlemen, the Bible, biblical term is the gray beards. In fact, ageism has actually been something that uh, many have fought quite vehemently against over the past several decades. What does the Bible have to say? Well, here's a few samples out of Proverbs, both of them. Proverbs 16.31. Some of you may want to join this, uh, jot this down, make this your life verse, maybe, uh, depending on uh, how many candles are on the cake. Here's Proverbs 16.31. Gray hair is a crown of glory. Yeah, I thought you'd like that one. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. 
A few chapters later in Proverbs 20:29, 20, we have this. The glory of young men is in their strength, but the splendor of old men is their gray hair. However much of it may, may remain. Throughout the Bible, throughout even uh, the culture and the context around which we have both the Old and the New Testament, gray hair is a sign of wisdom, and our elders are to be respected and revered. As I mentioned, that has not always been the case, leading uh, very interestingly to the creation of a group back in 1970 uh, that was uh, colloquial. Lee, I always struggle with that word, called the Grey Panthers. Uh, that title actually comes from uh, Johnny Carson. Um, if you're not familiar, there was, uh, there was a woman who was working as, uh, I might have been a secretary or something, as, uh, at, the, at, at her church. It was a Presbyterian church, and she turned 65 and, under the state law, had to retire. Mandatory retirement. You're done. Uh, she didn't like that, didn't think that was fair, and so she organized a group that began to fight for seniors' rights and uh, to, uh, as a grassroots organization, combat what she called ageism. That uh, she also, as the group grew, started taking on the uh, often deplorable conditions in seniors' homes, as well as other laws that were discriminatory against the aged. Because ours is a culture that does not respect age. Um, and all too often considers the seniors in its midst to be more burdensome than worthy of praise and respect and even care. Uh, so she ended up going on the Johnny Carson show, and of course it's 1970, so he compared it to the Black Panther movement, which was, uh, which was large at the time, and said, well, what you're describing sounds like the Grey Panthers, and that kind of stuck. Today, in modern political uh, circles, there's something quite similar. It's called gray power. Uh, that when uh, someone goes to put themselves up for election, when politicians go, grays are now a voting contingency. And you have to go and listen to them and tell them what you think they want to hear. You have to glad hand to them. You ignore them, in other words, at your peril. Because if they decide that they want to vote for you, then you want them in your corner. If they don't like your messaging, they're going to hamper or even prevent you at the polls. All of this is just to give a couple of real-world examples to say that senior saints are a gift, and they are to be treasured. And any church congregation, because we're talking about a few things about the nature of the church, Senior saints are not only to be in it, but they play a critical, critical role. There is uh, something else out in, in, in contemporary kind of church building uh, that seems to want to target, and it's, it's quite erroneous in doing this, but it exists nonetheless, in targeting a youthful demographic. Uh, this is how uh, we end up, and this is how I can tell I'm approaching 50. Uh, we end up with uh, what I call... Uh, rock and roll laser light show churches. They're heavily based in music and feeling and entertainment, and it's all done because there's a young demographic out there, and we've got to get the young demographic. Absolutely, I would agree. Youth need to hear the gospel as much as anyone. But where this uh, idea goes off the rails is to think that they can only be reached through being like the culture that we're trying to reach them in. And then what happens is you can end up, you can build a church that's quite homogenous in its makeup. It's made of a lot of youth, and that's it. Now, it may be large in size, numerically, but it is not healthy. Um, turn, if you would, uh, several, several books over to 1 John, if you would, and I'll show you exactly what I mean. Well, actually, what the Bible means. 1 John writes, uh, it's toward the end of, well, kind of the middle of chapter 2. John gives us a reasons for his writing of this letter, and in addressing the church that this would go to, and by extension all churches that his letter would go to biblically, including our own, he breaks the congregation down into three broad demographics. Here's what he writes. It's a uh, 1 John 2, starting at verse 12. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven 
for his name's sake. I am writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. And then he goes and he repeats these three same demographics. I write to you children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So John twice gives us three clear demographics within the church, within the assembly of the called out ones. This is not relegating them according to age. He's relegating them according to length of walk with Christ. So some of you are children. You're new Christians. And he shows you what new Christians know. I know my sins have been forgiven, and I know the Father. I'm just at the beginning of my walk and of my understanding of the Bible and of doctrine and how to apply proper biblical teaching to my everyday life. So some of you are children. So I mention this because it is possible to be a 50-year-old child in the church if you've just come to salvation, if you've just come to faith. In the middle, a little longer down the road with Jesus, you've got young men. Again, this is a spiritual descriptor. And then finally, fathers. These are the people, and I guess we could say also mothers and young women. It's possible to have a very lengthy walk with Christ and still be you know, middle-aged, depending on when your walk started. Now, I mention that because to go back to Titus, the words that we are talking about when we talk about older men, older women, younger men, younger women, that is not, so John's talking about in a spiritual sense, Paul is writing to Titus quite literally about numbers. How many candles are on the cake? How many winters have you seen? So older men, we are quite literally talking about older men and older women, we are quite literally talking about older women. These are the, this is the gray power in the church. Titus, as you travel around the island and revisit these nascent churches, as you start to put them into good order, do not overlook the seniors in the midst. In fact, give them particular attention. Because God, in building the church, has very intentionally designed it that it is supposed to span multi-demographics. Yes, in a, in a very real sense, as I often say, the church is a single demographic. It is composed entirely of redeemed sinners. But within the community of the redeemed, there are those who have just started a walk with Christ and those who have walked with Christ for a long time. And sometimes the ones who have walked with Christ for a long time are advanced in years, if you'll allow me to put it that way, but not always. But no matter whether they have been walking with Christ for a long time or not, you want the people who are advanced in years. Because whether they've walked with Christ or walked through the world, their walk has given them a very specific skill set and outlook on life. And that's why they're in the church. Older men are to be. First, let's look at the character at verse 2. The character of older men. So Titus, as you're traveling around the island of Crete, and by the way, the Isle of Crete did not have a good reputation at all. The Cretans are lazy drunkards, and that's written by a poet who is native to Crete. He's holding the mirror up to his own. That's going to make it very difficult, isn't it, for Titus as he now goes without Paul into really newly planted churches. Where do I find, as I mentioned, that plurality of elders? Where do I find some godly men to kind of build up and then hand the reins over to. This is why I said it's an investiture. This takes time often. So what's he to be on the lookout? Well, be on the lookout, Titus, for these kinds of older men. And if they're not all the way here, then this is what you're going to have to guide them into and towards. Older men are to be sober-minded dignified, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Let me quickly break those down for you, because it can be easy to get lost in these Pauline lists. Sober-minded um, can be taken both ways, two, two, two ways and both equally. One is, uh, it would be very surface, not intoxicated. So in a country full of lazy drunkards, Titus, try to find guys who aren't drunk all the time. Right? Sounds simple. However, this can also be, beyond being intoxicated with wine, it, it can apply to their life as a whole. Be on the lookout. Older men, you are supposed to be, by the time you reach whatever age you are, 
You are supposed to be vigilant in your life. You're supposed to be sober-minded. That is, you're able to focus on things and cut away and ignore the distractions of life. Maybe the, by, by way of footnote, I've got it here. You may think at this point, how old are we talking, Britain? When he says older, and by the way, it, it is clearly, um, as I said, it's age, not length of walk with Christ. The word that he uses here, uh, Paul does, for older men is the same as is used in Luke 1.18. So this is the angel appearing, uh, talking about the birth of the soon-to-be birth of John the Baptist. Um, and um, you may remember that Zechariah says, how is this going to be? I am an old man. He's literally talking about his age. Same in Philemon, uh, Paul describes himself as Paul the aged. So this is how we know we're talking about um, numbers in terms of age, not length of walk with Christ. But the, the idea here behind being sober-minded is that by the time you get to, I don't know, 50 for the men, maybe 60 for the women, it's a bit nebulous. And of course, medicine continues to push that back. But by the time you've got some gray hair, and some gray beard, and increasing numbers of wrinkles in the mirror, you should have walked enough of life's road, if not life with Christ's road, but you should have walked enough of life's road to know what is good for you and beneficial for you and what is not, what is to be focused on and what is rightly ignored, sober-minded. They're also called to be dignified. This is serious. Not grave, not, not you know, heavy with gravitas, but serious about the things of life. Again, it, 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 it goes hand in hand with knowing what's important in life. When you're, when you're young, oh, the drama of, do you remember the drama of high school, for example? Or even grade school? Oh, we were in the playground, I mean, we, we had a kid, so I, I know all this by experience, right? Your, your child or your, your eight-year-old child or your grandchild comes home in tears because somebody was mean to them in the playground, and that's it. Life is over. I remember being 16, 17, got my heart stomped on by a young woman on Valentine's Day. That's it. I will never find love. She was the one. The drama. When you're young, everything is of such, it's Wagner-like importance. Everything, life is an opera, and the highs are high, and the lows are low. Well, you see that happening in your children, your grandchildren, and you having already gone through that, you know that that's not true. There'll be another Valentine. You'll make other friends. In fact, the child that was mean to you will probably forget all about it tomorrow. But in youth, everything is huge and dramatic because you don't know what to delineate. You don't know what to focus on and what to ignore, and therefore you focus on everything. And it engenders a lot of anxiety and tears. Well, if you've walked many, many miles of road, you know that this too shall pass. And you learned that experientially. It makes you serious. Honorable is another way of singing this. Older men in the church, you are to be honorable. That is that when other demographics, other age groups in the church look at you, they should see that you have a reasonably well put together life that makes you worthy of honor. Are younger eyes in life, not just the church, but are younger eyes in older gentlemen in your life looking at you and going, I'd like to be like him. God willing, when I get to whatever age you are, I'd like to, be, I'd like to have it to, as together as that person. That's how you are to be. Uh, it's a similar, to, uh, a similar word and turn of phrase that we find in 1 Timothy 3.8, and there it's described as men of dignity. Older men are to be dignified in their lives, in their carriage. They're also to be self-controlled. Uh, sophon is the Greek word here, and it means an inner outlook that regulates an outer behavior which differentiates it ever so slightly from sober-minded, you know, not being intoxicated by wine. This is more all-encompassing. You are to have an inner outlook that regulates your outer behavior. Uh, that is, are you sensible in your actions and your choices? Are you prudent in what you say as well as what you do? Older men are to be uh, sound in the, here's three things, sound in the faith, sound in love, and sound in endurance. The faith, 
sound in the faith, where we, we healthy, strong, vibrant, are you those things in these three categories? It's the opposite, think of it this way, of being so sick that you were debilitated. Is your faith like that? Is your faith uncorrupted? Again, this is all I want you to keep in mind as we go through these about younger eyes looking at you and your life and listening to your words with their little ears. Are you living a faith? Are you following Christ in such an exemplary way that younger Christians look at you and say, I want to be like them. I want to be like her. I want to be like him. Are you sound not only in the faith but in your love, which would be the application of your faith? Are you coldly orthodox? I mean, it really doesn't do anything for anyone, yourself included, if you just have a head full of Bible verses that never actually reach your fingertips. You never do anything with them except spout them at people. Head knowledge is great, but it requires application in a life. Where are the fruits of your knowledge, in other words? This manifests itself in love. And the word here, I've mentioned several times, there are about five words in Greek that can all be translated into English as love. This is agape. It's the highest, purest, most sacrificial kind of love. Husbands, incidentally, it is with this kind of love that you are to love your wives because it is this kind of love that Jesus purchased the, and loves the church. He loves it in the highest possible way. He loves it sacrificially. Are you expressing that in your walk? Are you expressing and exemplifying endurance? You are to be sound in endurance, and this is not just physical. Praise God, because I'm almost 50, and occasionally my knee gives out on me, so it's not going to get any better from here on out, right? Not physically. Again, spiritually, in your exemplary walk with the Lord, older men, are you exemplifying steadfastness, perseverance? Uh, the word actually used here um, is uh, hypomone, which is, uh, if you know the hy hypodermic, hypothermia. Hypo is the Greek prefix for under. Hyper means over. But this is under. The word that Paul uses here to, to older men is quite literally, do you, you must under remain. That is, you must remain under. Under what? Well, under the Lord, under his commands, under his mercy, under his example. Are you staying with God, in other words, through all of life's challenges? You know, the longer you live this life, the more challenges pile up. Now, hopefully, the more challenges you have in the rearview mirror. But I want you to see that this is what makes senior saints such a treasure. This is why a healthy church has little children, both in the faith and in numbers, has little children and all the people in the middle and then the seniors at the other end of the spectrum. They're not to be just tolerated and they are not to be just ornaments, but they have a very serious charge. What is their charge? Well, first off, let's take a look at older women because you'll see the charge in there at verse 3. Older women, likewise. So, likewise, pretty much everything that was uh, aforementioned of older men, older women, you have that as well. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior. This means sacred. Sacred in your conduct and your demeanor. Um, again, it's the island of Crete. Everybody's a lazy drunkard. Finding women of this caliber is going to be difficult. They're going to be few and far between and thin on the ground. So Titus, the charge would be, if you don't find them, you've got to encourage them to put off whatever they're doing and put this on. They are to be reverent in behavior. Now, here's some examples. How do I be reverent in behavior, you may ask? Well, start with cutting slander out of your life. Gossiping. As, uh, as was once said to me, clucking at the hen house. This is a kind of destructive, back-talking, back-stabbing behavior that has no place in the church's godly women. So if that's you, stop it. And if you see that in younger women, stop them. Correct them. See, you're to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to too much wine. That's just a cultural affectation. But I do have a note here about wine mommies. And some of you will know 
better than others what that means. This is this awful stereotype that has crept in, particularly less around seniors, more around uh, stay-at-home mothers and women in their, I don't know, I will say 40 up, that, you know, a glass of wine every day is what she needs to get through. Oh, it, it's wine o'clock somewhere. Yeah. No, again, that is a worldly affectation, a worldly stereotype. It has no place among the women whom Christ has redeemed to newness of life and to be examples to the other women. So, leave the culture behind as they're drowning in, in wine and wine moms. Just be a mom. Don't be a, <laughs> you don't need a prefix. Now, why are they in the middle of the verse? This is where I want to get you. They are to teach what is good. So they're not slanderers. They're not enslaved to too much wine. They're living in an exemplary life. That is, it's not perfect, because there's none of us perfect, but they are living the kind of life where young women can look at them and go, she's really got it together. I want to be like her. Look at the ease with which she navigates this. I bet she's got a lot of experience, things that she could teach me. Well, indeed, here now we come to the whole reason why a healthy church must have senior saints and why a church with senior saints is not burdened, it is blessed. They are to be teachers to young women, and they are to teach what is good and so train young women to love their husbands and, and, and on to the end of uh, verse 5. They're to be teachers of what is good. Um, I'm glad that he reemphasizes that there's a training aspect of it. Teachers of good, this is one word. They are to be uh, kalodidaskolos. They are to teach literally what is good, beautiful, pure, holy, as opposed to everything that is dark or evil or worldly. And when they do teach younger women in all the ways of goodness, meaning godliness, what they are doing is that by default they are training. Uh, again, this word, I, I, I've mentioned this in several, several instances. I love and encourage us to always pay close attention to words in the Bible, particularly if you're studying it, say, through New Testament Greek, that appear only once. And this chapter, let alone this letter, is full of one-time only words. What do you mean by that? The word he says train is so, uh, my Greek pronunciation is always so terrible, uh, uh, sofroidzo, sofroidzo, yes. I'm glad it only appears one, one time because it's hard to say. But it means to pass on, to entrust to someone else. The reason I like the one-time only words is that means that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, no other word or turn of phrase possibly could fit. And so it behooves us to pay close attention to this incredibly specific word. Women, you are to teach what is good, and in the teaching of that, you are to pass on what is good. Well, how can you pass on that which you don't know? See? How can you pass on that which you haven't lived? Well, you have lived it. That's why your, your years are such a blessing to the church. And you're training whom? Young women. This is uh, literally, again, talking about age, not walk with Christ. It's, uh, the Greek word here means new in time. They have fewer candles on the cake than you, fewer trips around the sun. So you are to train young women to do what? Well, a whole list of things. Here's a few examples. Love their husbands. Well, duh. Well, you'd think. Now, a moment ago I mentioned there's many words in Greek that can be translated into English as love. This is not agape. Older women, you are to train younger women. This is really, I had to really sit and think about this. This is philandros. It's filial love. It's uh, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Older women, you are to train younger women to love their husbands Friendship doesn't do it, doesn't do it justice in, it, in the closest, purest, most intimate kind of friendship. And I thought, well, that's very odd because the call to husbands is you are to agape love them. You are to sacrificially love them. So why, why is it so different from wives? And then I sat and I thought about how many, how many women, and I don't need to see a show of hands. <laughs> how many of you are out there married? Yeah, I love them. I don't really like them. 
He's not really, I wouldn't call him my friend, let alone my best friend. I think that that's what's implied. That's why this word is very intentionally being used. You have to love him like your nearest, dearest friend. Women, young women, and here, older women, here's what you need to teach the young women through your own experience, whether you've been married or not, or whether you've just been through decades and decades of observing marriages, whether they were great or whether they shipwrecked themselves. You are to train the younger women not only to like their husbands, but to be their co-workers, their helpers, the one who comes alongside them, lifts them up, helps them, is not burdensome to them as much as they lean on them. To be a friend and helper, this goes all the way right back to the creation. Adam's lonely. I look everywhere in the, in the animal kingdom and there's nobody like me and there's nowhere found a helper for me. It's the first not good thing before the fall. And so God takes Adam's rib out and he makes Eve out of Adam. And says, here, here's your helper. My companion, my friend. I love that line in Shakespeare's play Coriolanus where the, the anti-hero is confronted by his wife. He calls her best of my flesh, not just flesh of my flesh. You're the best part of my flesh. Women, take a look at him when you get home and evaluate whether or not you feel that way. Do you trust him? Do you like him? Do you extend him grace? Are you helping him? Or are you adding to his burdens? You're trained to love your husbands and be self-controlled, right? So it's your relationships as well as your person. Self-controlled, pure, keepers at home, kind, subject to their husbands. These are more than just behaviors. They are the fruits that embody the word of God, which is why at the end of the verse he says, older women, you have to train the younger women to do all these things because if you don't, then they just become another generation bearing the label but not the fruit, saying this is who I am and demographically this is how I vote and this is how the, the, the high my name is label that I wear, but if you actually want to see me be Christian rather than just describe myself as a Christian, total disconnect. There's too much of that in the world already. And older women, you are given to the church in order to stop and break that toxic cycle of hypocrisy. If a young, yeah, thank you very much. Took me two and a half years, but I got applause. But, right? Look, there's far too much, far too much of either people coming into a church environment that is full of gray hairs and going, oh, there's a lot of silver hair here. And thinking there's nothing for me here. Youth, I'll get to you in a minute. But also of seniors buying into that false narrative and thinking, well, this is just a church full of us old people getting older. We have nothing to contribute. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You would not have been given for the health and building up and edification of the church if that were true. You do have something to give. You have mentorship. This is your calling. Because young women, you are to be trained and mentored by older women. But look at the very next verse, verse 6. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. So older men, your call is the same. Find the younger men in terms of age and maturity and walk down the road of life. Find the younger men because you have experience that they need. Look, you've navigated things that are brand new to them. You know how to get, get through the, the raging river. You know where the ford is. You know that it may be dark now, but the sun will rise again. You've been through life's experience. Look, I don't know how many of you know this, and please go and look him up on the internet. There's a guy, uh, I didn't catch his name, but he has a YouTube channel called Dad How Do I? He's a Christian. And these are short videos uh, that are all about Dad How Do I? ellipses. Here's some examples. By the way, this guy recently turned 60. He, had, he gave a birthday video. And he's been doing the channel for four years. Topics include, so dad, how do I throw a football? Dad, how do I catch a football? Th those are both important. Dad, how do I do, he's got several short videos on basic automotive maintenance. How do I change the oil filter? How do I change the tires? How do I change a, a headlight? How, dad, how do I install a bathroom faucet? 
or swap out a toilet. Dad, how do I tie a tie? Dad, how do I make mashed potatoes? How do I make meatloaf? He's got several basic kitchen recipes. Dad, how do I shave? This channel has five million subscribers, which means that there are millions of young men who don't know how to do what we would think are these basic skills in life. Why? Because they are coming out of generations of absentee fathers and broken families. I speak from experience in this. My dad left, left the family. Our family fell apart when I was 12, uh, which meant that very, very shortly afterwards, I kind of needed to do something about this peach fuzz that was appearing on my face. Well, my dad had left this old electric razor under the, under the bathroom sink, so I got it, shaved it. There was a reason he left it, because it just burned all over the place. But I didn't have someone there to show me how to get a blade and get a good wet shave. It was years. I was into my 20s before I shaved with a blade for lack of a mentor. And that's really the point of this whole text. I have to wrap this up and land the plane. But this all, again, the, the final few verses, Paul turns this back on Titus. He says, Titus, you need to lead the charge because you're going into an environment where you're, it's going to be hard to find these types of people, so you need to set the example, which is what we have in 7 and 8. So Titus needs to show himself, in all respects, the model of what he's looking for and what he's training. A model of good works in both his teaching, he needs to show integrity and dignity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Again, this circles back to the big issue. A healthy church has the full family of God. And in the full family of God, there are grandmas and grandpas. Look, if seniors weren't necessary to either the functioning of society or the functioning of the church, we'd all die at age 45. But God has ordained that we have many, many years to go because your experience is a gift to the church. It's a critical, important part of the church. I want to close on this one out of Isaiah. Oh, first off, remember, sorry, give me a moment because I said I'd get to the youth and I want to leave you out. So the call to senior saints, the charge to senior saints is to mentor and be examples in the church. Youth, you have to allow yourself to be mentored. I could say more on that, but I'm, I'm at time. So you have to, and this is 1 Peter 5.5, 5, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Uh, you need to jettison any worldly attitude that the, you have nothing to learn from. What is that? Don't trust anyone over 30? Yeah, you, you have a lot. Please find someone over 30 and trust them. As much as their charge is to build up and mentor, your charge is to submit and be mentored. You who are younger, be subject to your elder. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. And here's the reminder, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Seniors, I want to leave you with Isaiah 46, 4. Even to your old age, says the Lord, I am he, and to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. I will carry and will save. I know that it gets harder with every trip around the sun that to draw close to that finish line and to finish well. But rest assured, this is also why the gift of the church has been given, so that you do not need to run this race alone or unloved or unappreciated. So I encourage you this morning to seriously think about discipleship, mentorship, and... Um, Get to know some of the youth here, and youth, vice versa, all right? The church will be healthier for all of that. God, our Heavenly Father, the time goes so quickly, but thank you so much for your word, and thank you for the gift of the church, a healthy church, Lord, that is not made of a single demographic, either in terms of spirituality or just age, but encompasses those from every walk of life, no matter how long they've been walking it. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the seniors amongst us. The, the gray hair is not a derogatory term. It is a crown of glory. Help us to appreciate them. And Lord, help all of the seniors that you have given to this congregation 
find ways to train up the younger generations to come alongside, befriend them, guide them, nurture them, so that this may be a healthy, vibrant church that throws off all the worldly narratives and lives as the family and the household of God. Amen.